when you're on uh, your Uber driver and he starts telling you, <laughs> yeah. hey, man, have you seen this token called Pepe? You're like, oh, my God, I got to sell all this stuff. So the D-pin, the, the AI aspect of it, the Web3 gaming aspect of it, the Layer 2s, Layer 3s, and everything else that's you know in, in between. There's so many things that are new and interesting that will actually help things move along in our global economy. What, my Bitcoin, I want to have my Bitcoin forever. Yeah. I want to hold it for as long as possible. And I want everything else I'm into to be the stuff I sell every cycle. Bitcoin, though, I want it because I'm, I'm a crazy person who thinks it's going to be a million dollar asset in the future, things like that. Let's just say the dollar collapse. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and he's like, let's say the dollar collapse and it gets backed up by Bitcoin. Everything's by Bitcoin. He goes, so all you're telling me that all these ETFs and all these institutions are going to own like essentially four to 8%, probably 10% at some point. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, how the heck is that decentralized? Always have a moon bag. I can't tell you how many times in previous cycles I've seen something do a 100x or 500x or whatever. Everyone thinks, okay, that's done. Yeah. And then it does another 100x after that or something. People like say, why do you always talk about taking profits? I go, because as time goes on, I'm going to dump. And uh, it's up to you to figure out when it is to sell for you and take profits. If you don't, I will dump on you. I will dump on every single person watching this this video. I want you to take profits. I want you to be financially secure. And I want you to do a smart thing that is for you. Hey, friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Andy and Friends podcast. I'm your friend, Andy. And in this episode, I talk with Rob from Digital Asset News. I'm sure many of you who listen to this podcast and watch my channel are familiar with Rob's YouTube channel. In this episode, we talked about the current landscape of crypto, uh, where Rob is investing, his investing strategy around crypto, when he will be selling, when he'll be looking to take profits. We talk about what narratives he's looking at in crypto. We also talk about his rules for crypto investing and a lot of great advice just for anybody out there who's learning and wanting to know how to navigate this space. Let's jump into it. And here we are on the episode with Rob. Good to see you. Handy is good to be here, man. But it's been some time, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first time we've been at a meeting. This is good. First real life outside of the crypto verse in the real world meeting. It's it's, it's strange. This is how people used to do it. You know, they used to meet face to face. They'd actually shake a hand. There was no Zoom meetings. There God was forbid. no. Yeah. <laughs> but here we are. But I'm glad I'm here in Austin. We're here for consensus. I know you actually live here, but uh, it's good to meet up with people that uh, I've been following for a while. Yeah. So I want to start this with the most basic of basic questions just because I want to I want to learn this about you. When did you start in crypto and why? Like what compelled you to enter the wild west of yeah. crypto? So in 2012, my son came home from school and he said, hey, uh, there's this kid at school and he's selling Bitcoin and it's $500 for 500 Bitcoin. It's on a hard drive. And I go, that's fantastic, Alan. What the hell is Bitcoin? And then, you know, when you first start, like you're trying to understand what it is, you're trying to explain, it's like, well, it's decentralized it's government and nation states and it's going to be really a thing. And, you know, it's decentralized. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, kid. I go, no, I'm not going to buy 500 Bitcoin for $500. That was my first intro. And of course, I always look back, me and my wife, we talk about it. Even if I would have bought for 500 bucks, I guarantee I would have sold it at 750 or 1,000 because I didn't know what I had. So fast forward to 2017, and I and of course we hear about the China bans, and I was like, "See, kid, I told you, it never is gonna work." And then we get later into it, November. It actually was November of 2017. And I go, you know, Bitcoin at the beginning of the year was like a thousand bucks, and now it's 8,500 bucks. Maybe I should get into this. And of course, when you first get into it, what is it all about? Number go up. Mm -hmm. Number go up. I like that. And you get into that. And then before you know it, you think you're a genius because it goes up yep. to 10, then 15, then 20. And then you're into crazy stuff like Ethereum and XRP. And I went from pennies to dollars. And you're like, I'm the smartest man alive. This is so simple. And then it crashes. So that was my my first foray into crypto 2017, 2018, my first cycle. Yeah, 2017, $20,000 Bitcoin, 2019, $3,800 Bitcoin. Yeah. If you can survive those movements and you're still like in the space or you'll have like interest in the space, like more power to you because it's you have to be like a rare breed to deal with that type of stuff. And that's the number one reason why everyone's like, it's a scam. Volatility is, you know, is the thing wrong with it or whatever. But I think we see the volatility as a good thing. 
Well, I mean, opportunity. yeah, we, we, exactly. We see it as a good thing, but like for you, actually for every, anybody in, in this, in this whole arena, like when you take a look at like with Bitcoin mining, I'm sure at some point you're like, Hmm, this is becoming not as profitable as it used to <laughs> yeah. be. Wow. This is a lot of electricity. Wow. I got to upgrade this before you, you're, you know, you're like, well, how can I really get ahead? And it really just comes down to just sticking it out, sticking it out and going, well, there's hard times and there's good times. I think if I'm just around here for the long haul, things will actually work out. And I didn't really, like back then, that was really the second cycle because the first, everything kind of kicks off with with the halving, right? 2012 was the first halving. 2013, we get an all-time high. And then we get what I call the dips and reset. Then we go through a halving in 2016. 2017 is an all-time high. So it was our second one. I didn't realize that, I, I didn't even realize about the four-year cycles back then. And who knows if they're going to stay intact. But m- looking back, if someone would have told me, Rob, it's okay, just hang around for these, you know, just have a long-term horizon and the long-term could be at a minimum of four years, which is what a lot of the TradFi people do not say. They say, oh, just, you know, stick around for a short amount of time and if you're not, then just get out. But if someone would have sold me four years, you're gonna like where you're gonna be. I think I would have held on to a heck of a lot more. And I think that's really what it comes down to, especially also with mining as well. Yeah, uh, crypto is a weird place to where um, it, rewards people and it enables people and it attracts people who have you know the brains of a fly like these really short term um expectations and uh and and mindsets where it's like i'm gonna you know 1000 x tomorrow or whatever um (laughs) and where you know having some long-term mindset is really helpful but still even if you have a long-term mindset in the world of crypto it's still short term compared to traditional markets like if you think about you know just over the past Five or six years uh, since you've been in crypto uh, heavily, since I've been in crypto heavily. Five or six years. What is that when it comes to traditional markets? It, you know, it's it, not even is it short. If you, and now that I think about it, not even really short. But before crypto, we were in real estate, and five or six years is not really much of anything because you're looking for, especially if you're holding on to like like houses or multiple unit uh, type of apartment complexes, even shorter long-term rentals, doesn't really matter. But if you're looking at five or six years, you're kind of looking a little bit funny, a little bit weird, unless you're like a flipper, but those guys are kind of like, they're the uh, they're the uh, uh, really fast type of trader. If you're looking at like 20, 30, 40 years and generational wealth is like passing this on to your kids so that they can also rent it out. And of course, for the tax benefits that you get for the depreciation value of those houses or those apartment complexes, you start to think to yourself, okay, 30 years, 40 years is not a long time. So like when you said five or six years, it's the same It's the same thing. I mean, 40 years, if you go back in any time in history of Bitcoin and go back then, you're way ahead, four years or before. So you said before the crypto world, it was real estate for you? Yeah, it's funny because like, well, before that, way, way before that, uh, when I was a young man without this white beard, uh, military. So I served in the military. It was a, what was used to be called an I one Bravo, which I don't know what it's called now. It's a combat medic. And then, uh, there for years and then, uh, got out, went into, uh, medical, did medical device sales, medical device marketing, and then finally went into, uh, for, uh, home healthcare as far as like, uh, for a nationwide, uh, intake coordinator. So we did that for, for years. And then we started to say, you know, I mean, the wife said, you know, time to get into a little bit more real estate. And you just save up and take a little bit of time. You buy a kind of a fixer upper, then kind of go from there. You get a long-term, short-term rental. And then, of course, maybe apartment complexes here. And before you know it, you're like, okay, we're doing okay. And then you don't have to work for anybody. And then, of course, when you don't work for anybody, you're like, wow, this is way better than I thought it was ever going to be. But then but then it becomes this. And we just talked about this before, which is like be, when you're not working for anybody, then what are your friends doing? They're working for somebody. So I want everybody who's watching this video to start to really start to invest more and get into crypto a little bit. That way I can have more people to hang around with because I don't need anybody to work a nine to five anymore. Yeah, so uh, if you're watching, Rob just said, quit your job (laughs) so we can have more friends. That's what it comes down to. Not financial advice. Oh my God, no. So now that, so real estate and stuff and the traditional world, then crypto comes along. Are you mostly crypto now? Is it still a good split? Like what's your overall investing strategy? It's more of a split in all honesty. I mean, we get it into because 
digital assets and crypto take most of our time now because it's 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 such an interesting space and there's things that are really emerging that i mean just the narratives that are going out the things that i've 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 heard a little bit here on consensus and the dpin the de decentralized physical infrastructure networks the ai aspect of it the web3 gaming aspect of it the layer 2s layer 3s and everything else that's you know in in between it takes up so much time because there's so many things that are new and interesting that will actually help things move along in our global economy. The real estate part isn't really that tough. It's just, you know, making sure that the tenants are happy, making sure that the taxes are paid, making sure that everything is is up to snuff as far as like when we actually turn over things on our short-term rentals. So, and of course we have people that help us uh, do that, property managers. So it's not, that's not the tough part. The tough part is staying up to date and going, okay, which one of these digital assets are going to be the fastest horse? And that's a tough thing. So like if you're into that realm, it's tough. Or if you want to be simple and just say, you know what? I don't know about this other stuff. I don't know what's going to happen with Pepic, but I think Bitcoin's going to be around here for a long time. So that's why like for us, we have like uh, most like a, like a hodl type of uh, bags, which would be the Bitcoin, the blue chips. And then we have the risky aspects. That's why we have two channels, digital asset news and then Dan Degen when you want to you know risk it all and potentially lose everything. So, okay, a lot a lot of things I want to talk about with what you just said, but maybe let's start here. Uh, how do you view um, like all these different things? You just talked about like the blue chips and stuff. And I'll tell you how, how I kind of view that stuff. And I'm just kind of curious what your take is. What, my Bitcoin, I want to have my Bitcoin forever. Yeah. I want to hold it for as long as possible. And I want everything else I'm into to be the stuff I sell every cycle. I put money in my pockets. I buy more Bitcoin. I have traditional investments, uh, lifestyle changes, yeah. that type of stuff. Bitcoin, though, I want it because I'm, I'm a crazy person who thinks it's going to be <laughs> a million dollar asset in the future, things like that. So how do you view things like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum or a blue chip versus everything else? So it's a funny thing, like like your mentality is the same mentality as my friend Simon Dixon from Bank to the Future. And Simon's one of those guys who got in around 2011 and was really pushing it. And of course, he's he's been around very relevant today and he, he gives great great information out there. His, his is advice is, I always want to have more Bitcoin at the end of the month than I did at the beginning of the month. Meaning at some point he actually does sell and he does transfer things into it and does make different plays. The one time he didn't do that was at Celsius when he invested some of his Bitcoin and lost his Bitcoin. And I was the same way as a matter of fact. So uh, nobody's infallible, that's for sure. So when I take a look at it, like when I take a look at like what are blue chips and what are like some of the altcoins, I think, to me, it it just takes a look at like like which ones have been around for not just the longest because some have been around for quite some time, and you look at them you're like, well, what are you doing, and what are your partnerships, and how much are you growing, and how much TVL, and when you take a real hard look at that, you're like, what is propping you up, and I can't, you know, of course you have to make that decision for for you or whatever that that digital asset is, but when I take a look at it, I feel like. Bitcoin is the king and is always going to be the king. And I know people will make fun of Ethereum, but we just had a Ethereum ETF. I think there's a lot of headwind or excuse me, tailwinds that's really going to you know push it out there. But there is one thing about Ethereum that uh, I, people have talked about. I live in Puerto Rico and I can just tell you that as far as like the crypto OGs that I meet, it's mostly Bitcoin and or Ethereum. And there is so much money and prestige that's in ethereum they will make this work regardless and i know like people say well layer ones are very slow that's why they're gonna have layer twos and layer th layer threes i know some people say well what about solana what about this other stuff solana is a great one and i think if, if we have to take a look at what's the next etf i mean if you take a look at the inflows for the institutions it's looking pretty positive for solana to get to that next step depending on what gary gensler says but when i take a look at it i kind of go down that list. And I would say like right now, Bitcoin, Ethereum, I know some people aren't going to like this, but I think Solana is going to be that next blue chip. And we just got a press story today that PayPal is going to do their stable coins on Solana. Well, one of the, what I, I have only had a chance today, a consensus to, to sit in on one session, but it was the Kathy Woods one. And that was the thing she said. She's like, you know, it was, we were not expecting Ethereum ETF. Very surprised to see it, excited to see it. Uh, but now that that's, you know, through the door, I imagine they're not going to do open the floodgates. But the next one that makes a lot of sense is Solana ETF. So there might be something there. But, you know, that's a VC coin. 
<laughs> yeah. So let so let me let me just address this this one part about Solana and the VC coin. I get this a lot every time I talk about it on, on the channel. Some people either you love it because you have a big bag of it, mm -hmm. or you despise it because you have a bag of something else. Yeah. And that's really what. It, and of course, people will say, "Well, it's not very decentralized." True, but it's a funny thing. Like with the with decentralization and you know maximalists who will talk about that. Like it has to be decentralized. But as soon as the price goes up, they're like, "Well, maybe it's not that big of a deal." I will direct your attention to BNB. It's a Binance chain. It seems like no one really cares that it's not de decentralized as well. And then, of course, if we ever talk about like the layer two solution, let's talk about base. My God, I think the only the only know that it has is probably Brian Armstrong in his bedroom. I'm not for sure that it's very properly decentralized. So yes, Solana, they have an issue with uh, decentralization, which I'm hoping to become a validator at some point. We'll see what happens. But as far as like the VC coin, and and we've seen this on like the All In podcast with uh, Shamath Pelehipataya and the, and the rest of the crew, and they make fun of how they're going to dump on people and essentially do all these things, fine. But, uh, you know, those guys got in at pennies in the dollar, probably. And then, of course, they wrote it all the way up to, what was it, 230, 240 at some point? Uh, yeah. I think at some point, and I, 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 hate, I hate this word smart money. I just want to say, you know, massive money. At some point, they want to take profits because they know how to do that very well. And then it starts to crash. And then we see what happens with SBF and FTX. And of course, it crashes even more. And before you know it, it's it's, it's sub $10. I think at some point, those guys probably said, you know, we got to get the heck out of here. They probably sold a bunch of it, right? And then now we're all on evil, even playing field, I think. And that's why I think it's not as big of a VC coin as some people might say. Do they probably buy it up lower? Well, yeah, but that's what we're all here for, right? If it goes down to a lower point and you, think, and you believe in it, now it's time to, to, to scoop it up. I can guarantee you, I know a lot of people that have scooped up Solana at a very low price, and I think they're waiting for it to, you know, to be the next big thing. So we'll see. Yeah, people freak out. There's always the, the news headlines and people freaking out when uh, like uh, old whale wallets and Bitcoin wake up and send stuff and sell it. And they're like, oh my, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of Bitcoin are being sold. I'm like, you should be celebrating this because now it's no longer being one individual holding that many. It's going to be distributed to a bunch of individuals or whatever. It's better for everybody. Those people like drop their bags so we can all have our back go up, right? <laughs> you know what's funny is I was talking, I was, I was walking the street. Someone, someone stops me and goes, hey, I see you on, on YouTube. A guy named uh, uh, Malik. And we were talking about things and he's like, he's like, you know, he goes, people are talking about decentralization, but he goes, he goes, no one really cares that these ETFs are gobbling up, you know, roughly a million different Bitcoin. And, and he goes, let's just say like the dollar. And it's funny. These are my fans, right? These are the people I talk to. Like, let's just say the dollar collapse. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and he's like, let's say the dollar collapse and it gets backed up by Bitcoin. Everything's by Bitcoin. He goes, so all you're telling me that all these ETFs and all these institutions are going to own like essentially four to 8%, probably 10% at some point. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, how the heck is that decentralized? I'm like, hey, Malik, <laughs> I don't know exactly your point. I get it. And hopefully it doesn't come to that point. But I think that you'll seeing it right now, these ETFs, people sell, they pick it up and off they go. Yeah, it's going to be a very wild uh, thing to watch that experiment develop because I mean, we're, this is like, I wasn't expecting any of this. Uh, I was not expecting the ETFs before the having to be approved. I wasn't expecting a new all-time high before the, the having to happen. I wasn't expecting these, the, you know, the, the most successful ETF launch of all time. And we don't know what the repercussions are. Does that mean the cycle is going to be longer? Does it mean we're not going to, we're out of the four-year cycle now officially? Like what, like, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So there's this, there's this theory called the um, elongated cycle or a super cycle, some might want to call it. And uh, I've heard this term super cycle. I heard it in 2017. Sounds cool. It sounds great. <laughs> and I heard it in 2021. And coincidentally, I'm hearing it in 2024, probably in 2025. Does that mean it can't go to a super cycle? At some point, I think the four-year cycles will go away because at some point we'll have a sort of equilibrium because there's only so much that you can get into. There's so much on the exchanges that people can do. There's so much on OTC that they can do. And you'll just start to see like small dips. And people will always point to the gold ETF. You know, the gold ETF, the first year volatile, then after that, it just pretty much went a straight line until the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, took a dip, but kept going up. So when I take a look at this, I'm like, as far as like a super cycle, man, man I hope it is. That'd be great. But I'm not going to bank on it because I haven't seen it. But saying that, as, as people know, watch my channel. I've been wrong. I've been wrong a lot. I was wrong on the Bitcoin ETF. I said it wasn't going to happen in 2017. I said it wasn't going to happen in 2021. I said it wouldn't happen in 2024. And I was wrong on the 2024. 
And the Ethereum ETF, totally wrong about that one. And then, of course, I would talk about Celsius and Voyager. And I thought that was going to be great. It was great until it didn't. So the things that I talk about, this is what I think about. But obviously, no one's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, twenty uh, Last cycle, 2021 peak, I thought we were going to $100,000 Bitcoin because I, I was one of the people who thought we were going to see the Bitcoin uh, ETF finally get it because there's so many that were... Uh, in the running there. And then when it they were all denied, I was like, oh, well, there goes the $100,000 Bitcoin journey this cycle, at least. I should have been a little bit more proactive about that. But hey, I mean, how can you know? So what, so with the Bitcoin, though, you, you talk about, you know, it's staying power and where it, you, where it is in your portfolio. Will you sell your Bitcoin this cycle? Will you hang on to that forever? Like, what do you do with that? So here's the, so I, I think about this, and this is not going to be very popular, but you have to be transparent. So like with my altcoins, even the blue chips, they will be sold and I will sell up to 80% of those. And I'm looking for specific indicators. And I talk about this on my show all the time. MVRVZ score, well multiple. Uh, you can take a look at the pie cycle top, fear and greed index, all that stuff, RSIs. And you can kind of see where it's going and hopefully you'll get somewhere around 60. To, may, if I get 60% of the top, I'll be very happy. Bitcoin, I will be selling Bitcoin as well. Andy will not be selling Bitcoin. <laughs> My friend Simon Dixon may sell Bitcoin, but at the end of the month, he will pick up more Bitcoin. I will be selling it. And the reason why is because of this. I know people will say, well, that's very, you know, if you think it's going to go to a million, why would you sell? It's because I don't believe in the super cycles, elongated cycles. I don't see them there. And if I sell, let's just say that I have, I don't know, let's say I have two Bitcoin, right? Let's say that I sell 50% of my Bitcoin. So I sell one and I have it in there. And I have it for, let's say, emergencies. Or let's say that there's some things that I need to pay off. Or let's say that I need a new kidney. Whatever it is, right? So I have those funds in there. As time goes on and I take a look at it, I think that we'll start to see more of dips and crashes for your cycles uh, as well. But if you look at the global stance for where we're at, and if, if the maximalists are correct, and we really do say that Every Bitcoin will be in every nation state. It'll be sovereign currency. It'll be backed and it'll be gold, silver, Bitcoin, if you believe in that, or some, some form of reserve currency. And Bitcoin becomes that, which is kind of becoming with the ETFs. And that means that there's not enough Bitcoin to go around. Even if you take all the millionaires in the entire world, I think you can only have like 0 0.01. Two, some, someone will correct me in the comment section. So if I keep one Bitcoin, I'm a whole Bitcoiner, I'm still pretty good. And my kids, they're just fine. They have just enough to do everything. I want to spoil them anyhow. I'm not going to shower them with crazy Bitcoins worth a million dollars. Road to ruination. So for me, I will sell a Bitcoin. I will sell half of it probably. And the other stuff, 80%, have a, uh, a moon bag for that to take off. So we'll see. Yes. Solid advice. There. Always have a moon bag. I can't tell you how many times in previous cycles I've seen something do a 100x or 500x or whatever. Everyone thinks, okay, that's done. Yeah. And then it does another 100x after that or something. So like just hanging on to, just, even, you sell off 90% of it, hanging on to that little sliver just in case yeah. can be valuable. Uh, so that's, okay, that's really interesting. So for, for people who don't watch your channel, and for people who maybe aren't super into technicals and various things, what are some like uh, some like uh, plebe level like indicator like okay, viewing like when to sell? How would you know if you were kind of a newer person in the space? Oh, this is easy. So when you're on uh, your Uber driver and he starts telling you, <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, hey man, have you seen this token called Pepe?" You're like, "Oh my god, I got to sell all this stuff." So that's that, that's just one of them. But like if like plebs and like to make it super simple. Look, there's no shortage of people who on YouTube and X who will tell you this is the top or this is the bottom. What's great about them is that they are right once, but they're wrong like the other 49 times. So you just have to kind of root those out as much as possible. For me, I just take a look at it and I there's some basics that I take a look at. And the first time I was just doing it by price predictions and fractals, I would just say, well, you know, Bitcoin went from 1,000 to 20,000, that's a 20X. So maybe we can go from the low to an X one to 10X, which would give us to 100,000 because we went to 10. Obviously, that didn't work. We hit to 73, didn't make it out, right? But we just have like these price points. Every 20%, I start to sell a little bit. This time around, I'm looking for a little bit more indicators. The one that I'm looking for, and you can find all these indicators for free, uh, most of them at uh, lookintobitcoin.com. And you can take a look at the one is the Pi Cycle Top, which was created by uh, Philip Swift in 2019. And people think that it was created in 2021. It wasn't. It was 2019. And it predicted very accurately the 2013 top, 2017 top. And 
coincidentally, a pretty good top for 2021. So it's when the 350 day moving average times two cross over the 100 day moving average. And then you kind of see where it goes and that's where pretty much the top is. Does that, is that gonna work? Well, that's just for Bitcoin. Now we get into like, let's take a look at the MVRV score, which is the market value versus realized value, take away with the Z to kind of take away all the, all the noise. And you can kind of, it's color coded. When it hits in the red, you wanna start to sell. When it gets into the green, you wanna start buying. Very, very simple, right? Or actually, no, I flipped that around. And another one I like to look at is time and risk bands. And time and risk bands is just the time that Bitcoin has been at a certain risk level over its entire existence. And you can also take this from time and risk bands from Bitcoin, you can do it for Ethereum, you can do it for Solana, you can do it for Cardano, everything that's out there. And it's it's actually what I base my dollar cost averaging strategy in. And what I take a look is when it's in the middle, it goes from 0 0.01, then 0 0.2, 25, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then one. When it's in the middle, I'm still dollar cost averaging. When it gets less risky, I double my dollar cost averaging to 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. And then when it's down here, which is coincidentally when it was like 17K or back in the day of March of 2021 was 35K uh, or 30,500. But then when it comes over here, the other side, and it starts to go to 0 0.6, 7, 8, 9, 1. When it's at the the time and risk band of one, it's only been there, I think like 28 days, 32 days, somewhere around there. So when it starts to get there, I'm really looking at, again, all these things to kind of combine and say, okay, this is my best estimation. And I'm gonna start to layer out. If I'm gonna layer in, I'm gonna layer out, right? I dollar cost average, I've been dollar cost average since 2022, which was kind of like throwing sand in the ocean some days. But uh, as time goes on and you start to take those profits, just chunks, 20%, 15%. 35% and then off you go. So that's that's where I'm going. And if anyone wants to watch those, there's a link in the all of my videos where it says when I'm selling 80% of my crypto. And there's a link to that video. That I like that dollar cost averaging strategy. Um, I can tell you that in like a, my first full cycle in uh, as everything crashed back down to earth in 2018, 2019, 2020, yeah. my dollar cost averaging strategy was I had an auto buy every week that was going. Yeah. That was that one. Yeah. But also I just watched the price and I, you know, when it dropped to like uh, $8,000, I'm like, holy shit, they can't can't go lower than this. I'm going to buy a bunch. And then it went to $6,000. i am like, this is really low. I'm going to buy more. And then it dropped below $4,000. i am like, oh my God, I can't go much lower than this, right? And I just bought more. Uh, so every time it just kind of surprised me, I just bought as much as I could. It turns out that was a great decision. Um, but you know, it was a great, it was a great, no, did, I, no science behind it though. And no, but I, I applaud you for it, but it's amazing when it goes that low and like you, like you, you may post that on like on a social media or you talk to your friends, like, what are you moron <laughs> and buying for the, this, this worthless tulip craze that you're yeah. getting into. And then of course now you're like, and then your friends are texting you like, Hey, what's up with that Bitcoin? You're like, you're going to get Bitcoin the price you deserve. So sorry. Yeah, I, I went, uh, um, my friends, re I have a, one group of friends who likes to remind me of this, but I was on a ski trip uh, and it was 2019 and Bitcoin was falling below 4,000. It, it did a big like $2,000 drop within a couple days below uh, $4,000 and we were skiing and I pull up my um, my cash app and I'm literally buying multiple coins and, and stuff. <laughs> um, and because I'm like, this is a mate. I'm I'm getting I'm getting in. I missed my opportunity to be previous cycle. I'm going to get in right now, and uh, they were like, "What is wrong with you? Like yeah. this is brain dead human here, going to lose all your money." And now they bring it up and like, "Why didn't we do that the same?" But yeah, how do you know? You don't. That but you do need that conviction in order to do those crazy things for sure. Exactly. And I'm sure your friends are like, we're going to get Andy into Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> we're going to have an intervention for yeah, him because exactly. this is ridiculous. And now here we are. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, before we got into this part of the conversation, you talked about a bunch of narratives. Um, I'm curious, what are the narratives that you're the most excited about for this cycle? I think it's because just because of how well NVIDIA has done. Very which, well. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's insane. I think I want to say that their market cap for the business itself is like 2.4, 2.5 trillion, somewhere around there. And I, th I think they're the third largest company in the world now. I'm pretty sure Jensen can do no wrong. Yeah, yeah, he's, I mean, he can walk on water now, mm -hmm. so it's amazing. Yes. But like, when you see something like that, the AI narrative, because I'm old, and, and I will tell you like, the dot-com era, you could have LiptonT.com, and all of a sudden like, genius, we need to get into that. How'd you guys get into the website? Oh, we didn't, we just put dot-com next to it. So like, anything with AI, I think it's gonna do very well. But there was, um, it was an interesting, one of the co-founders of ChatGPT, I forgot his name, it escapes me right now, but he talks about the big 
battle we're going to have coming up for AI is compute, compute power. He goes, there's only so many different processors that are out there or GPUs that we can use. There's only so much that we can actually create and, and, and move forward till we actually get AI to be on the level where we want it to be and beyond. So everybody's going to be fighting for compute. And I didn't know this, but like when you have these GPUs in these warehouses, they're um, not as optimized as you want want them to be. So they're, they may be running and using for for uh, for these for chat GBT, but they're not as well uh, versed and they're using like 15 to 20 percent sometimes. So what they're doing is they're saying like if you have GPUs across the way, we're going to want to use the unused GPU power for that. And if you do that, we'll pay you in this certain crypto. So I've seen like like renders doing this 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 type of thing. You've got Aether, A-E-T-H-I-R, which hasn't even launched yet. Uh, so, I mean, the, the token itself. You've got IO.net and a host and like uh, Gaiman also is doing the same thing for Web3. So I look at, and of course you've got uh, Ocean Protocol and you've got um, Singular. And I think there was one more that is the, the trifecta for where as they come and get uh, uh, merged together. So if you have all these AI, fetch AI, that's what it is. So if you have all these, these narratives coming, I mean, this AI narrative, I think there's a reason why you're seeing more of those. The question is, which one's going to make it? And maybe if you're like, look, I'm just here to turn a profit, maybe you start to dabble into each one and then find out which one that you think is going to make it and then go that route. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit of a believer that if AI is the monster, I think it will be this cycle. Uh, all we need is a couple of those to actually be winners and it will probably lift that that tide will lift all boats for a while until <laughs> until it cools off. Until they figure it out. Yeah. Right? But like some of my biggest positions, Flux, um, Clore, Octospace, these are all compute based projects, but small market caps because I like to dabble in the That's where you should go, everybody. If you're looking for a big gambler. Small market caps <laughs> is an, a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, all the names you mentioned is, yeah, those are all, all um, things in the space. Uh, what is interesting that you mentioned NVIDIA and, uh, and Jensen in a recent interview did say like he wants to make, you know, he wants to million X the, the availability of chips and make it to where it's such a commodity, so commoditized that it's like almost free to do this. Um, so there, that part is like, if that actually comes true, it's a little bit scary for all this kind of compute stuff now, but that's got to be. E, like decade at minimum away before we get to that level. Well, look at like like the internet. How many people had the internet in the very beginning, right? And of course, well, first of all, you had to get a, a DVD-ROM. I know if you guys know what these are, or CD. And you could actually get the CD with with the AOL and the little running guy. And you had to put that in there and you had to download it and actually make it work. And you're like, okay, now what? Now you're paying a hundred bucks a month for the worst service of all time. And you could download a picture every 30 minutes. And it was that was essentially what it is. Now, of course, everything becomes cheaper as time goes on. So maybe, but in the beginning, you got a good point. And even at that stage, it that was really far in the cycle of of the internet. The internet was invented in the '60s, yeah, yeah. '80s. It had the microscope amount of traction. '90s, and then AOL. And by that point, it's still like a niche thing. Very few people are even like they're just starting to grasp it, starting to make its way into you know normal homes, but still fairly rare on a global scale. You know what always interests me about me about the internet back then is I would hear about all the jobs that were going to be lost because people were like, well, this is going to take over this job and that job. But if, if you go if you go forward in time, you're like, okay, I need someone to do my SEO for my website. You're like, what are you talking about? I also need someone to do is like like Facebook ads and do a blog post. And like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. And now here we are. And we're like, oh, these are just new jobs created from that. So with AI, who knows if we actually do lose all these jobs or it's something else. I'm not for sure. Yeah. And like the the fear around, you know, these things, it's like a lot, of, you know, with automation and AI and various things, there's probably a lot of jobs it's going to get rid of. But will we be sad that those jobs are gone? There will be new opportunities and new jobs in the future that maybe are easier, nicer, or more lucrative. I don't know. So who's going to fix those robots? In the <laughs> beginning, it's going to be people. And then the robots are going to fix the robots. So like, we got time. It's just going to see like how much time do we have. We just have to be the people before they're truly like self-reliant. Then, yes, then we're screwed. Then we're screwed, and then we're all in the matrix, and it's all downhill. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the, the the AI projects you mentioned, are those ones that you're actually invested in for the cycle? Yes. It, it, look, everything that I talk about, I usually own, usually, except for, I don't, I don't think I own, I don't own Ocean. I don't own Singular. I don't, I, I do own Fetch AI. I own Aether. I don't own IO.net. And uh, what did I think? Uh, Render, I also own. So like, usually when I talk about things, it's because I'm super biased and I, I believe in them. But uh, so for all those projects, yeah, I will check out the ones you were talking about. Those low cappers, 
I'll probably talk about those on Dan DJ on the channel. Yeah. Uh, so you heard, you heard it here. Uh, Rob is just uh, shilling his own bags. Yes. He's just pumping his own bags. It's true. And uh, remember, uh, we have these rules on on, on my show. And uh, it, it starts off with, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. And everything's a scam until proven otherwise. And one of the last ones is called take profits. And I say take profits and people like say, why do you always talk about taking profits? I go, because it's, it's because for as long as I've been around, people round trip or they stick things into an exchange and they don't take it off. That's one of our other rules. Don't leave anything on the exchanges. So I'm just gonna tell you right now, as time goes on, I'm gonna dump. And uh, it's up to you to figure out when it is to sell for you and take profits. If you don't, I will dump on you. I will dump on every single person watching this this video. I want you to take profits. I want you to be financially secure. And I want you to do a smart thing that is for you. That's why no one can give you financial advice. I don't know your situation, not your dad. But again, it's all about making sure that you're protected, that you take those profits to do the things you want to do and live the life. Bitcoin's great, but I will tell you right now, it's not giving you family. It's not giving you, or it's not family, it's not time, and it's not health. It can help you do those things, yep. but it is not those things. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, we make videos about this stuff. We talk about this stuff. So like, you know, front run us, like sell, you know, sell yeah. your, dump your bags. Like, don't wait till we've made a video that we're like, we sold everything. And yeah. it's like, and that's the point where you're like, oh, he did it now. I got it. You're probably late at that point. Be a bunch of VCs and just dump on me and just like, ah, I told these suckers. And then, yeah, exactly right. And then make fun of us and X. I'll be happy. Like, congratulations. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> Uh, so AI, what are some other areas you're looking at? Web3 gaming. I, oh. I think, mm. yeah, Web3 gaming is one of those things. And we just actually, we heard a consensus. We're talking to the Brave browser team. And one of those, one of the things they're actually in, they're working together with uh, Karate Combat. And they say Karate Combat is a great, it's a great platform. It's great things that they're doing. But, you know, they say like they have to kind of wait for like some of their events to happen, which happen every so often, just like a UFC event in Karate Combat. But uh, we're talking about them as far as Web3. They're like, you know, with Web3 and the gaming, there is no really slowdown. Everybody wants to play those games. And if they want to do like, online wagering, if they want to own their NFTs, if they want to do anything with a with a token or an NFT itself, that will keep going. Even if we have another, God forbid, a pandemic, the people are still going to want to play games. They're still going to want to use those tokens for the Web3. So I see like Web3 being another, another big play. The only thing about Web3 is that the games that have been produced previously have been awful. And there is a, and rightfully so, the, 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 the Web2 gamers hate Web3 and for a good reason because it's a big cash grab or it was a big cash grab. The games I see coming out now look fantastic. Like you have a Star Atlas, you have an Alluvium, you have a uh, Pet Hooligan and stuff like that. They're really good games, games that gamers I think would want to play. So if we just, if they just focus on that and they go, look, you can play this game for free, like everything else is free these days. But if you want to own something or maybe want some wagering, there's another token you can do. Great, that'd be Web three. So I can see that being the next another another thing. So AI, that, and then decentralized physical infrastructure network. Like we talked about, like there was a big presentation being done by by Helium and World Mobile Token. And if, as far as like connecting the unconnected, that's a project that actually is working right now. You pay twenty dollars for unlimited talk, text, and data in different locations. You can get your own node. You can set it up, and you can start to mine the Helium uh, network token. There's actually three tokens. There's uh, Helium, Mobile, and IoT. So, like when I see something like that, and it actually is a working product, that's way ahead of the game. And there's one, another one called Hive Mapper, kind of like Google Maps and stuff like that. So, decentralized physical infrastructure network, World Mobile, and there's another one that I'm. Uh, involved with and yes i bought into it it's called minutes network essentially it's it's allowing for your calls that you do you're going to be able to eliminate the middleman and actually get paid for the calls that you do depending on the apps that you download and uh video on that one dandy i just uh i just started a conversation with minutes network oh, so i haven't uh, gosh yeah yeah you know, they sent me your video so i it's on my to watch <laughs> to watch list i gotta check that out uh i am so bullish on deep in it just makes so much sense it's like a win 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 um you can if you're a startup it's like you can get your entire you know n network and infrastructure up basically overnight because you incentivize normal people to do it for you and it has real use cases because it's all centered around data usually and this data has have real value just like total no-brainer i see one thing i don't understand is why amazon web service they have to go to a location they have to go okay we're gonna buy this land and we're gonna get tax on it which is gonna suck 
but we're going to build these, you know, couple acres. We're going to, we're going to build out these warehouses. We're going to put in these, these, this infrastructure. We're going to put in these, these, these hard drives and we are there for the cloud, right? So they're going to have everything downloaded there and that's great. And of course they centralize it and they make a ton of money. If I was Amazon web service, I'm looking at myself, I'm like, how long can this really last? Because it's going to be so much easier for someone to go, Hey, why don't you use the excess uh, computing power or the uh, hard drive space on my computer? And you can pay me and you can do that over across, you know, what are 8 billion people or the people that are connected in the, in the world for internet. It's like 6.2 billion, somewhere around there. If I can do that and I can get paid for it and I can do like essentially what Amazon web services with the overhead being so low, I don't see why they're not getting into it. Unless I'm, I, maybe I'm missing some with Amazon. Maybe they're doing something in the background. Yeah, I don't know. But like, yeah, my number two portfolio position, Flux. That's what, yeah. Flux, uh, I gotta remember. Decentralized that. Amazon web service has been their big pitch for a while and they got countless nodes around the planet that are, you know, hosting websites and apps and various things. And, um, I, yeah, I just don't know if it's just, um, we further into the cycle and then it gets more and more adoption. It's just, it's just, you know, all big technology shifts just take time, but it also seems inevitable and like a no brainer to me. I don't, yeah. I think I'm missing something because it makes, it makes too much sense. So, <laughs> so it makes too much sense and I'm not that smart that I'm missing something. So we'll figure it out later. But the, to go back a second, the gaming, I am also just like, all about the gaming now i mean uh, our, our mutual friend uh, jesus, jesus. Mar martinez he he's the real guy to talk to about all this because he lives and breathes that stuff but i'm just yeah last cycle it was interesting like experiment you know, the clickers and stuff and it was cash grab and there wasn't really anything fun to play Axie. but it pushed the ball forward which is which is good this cycle though there's some actual real stuff and i'm not actually in um, any of the ones you mentioned, but like uh, I'm in uh, Shrapnel Shrapnel's a good and guy. Off the Grid, um, yeah. like AAA titles with teams with actual pedigree, with mechanics that um, like like on Shrapnel, one of the things I, I keep telling everybody very excitedly, they have this mode that's a uh, pink slip mode to where when you drop into the, the server on that mode, if you get killed, you lose all your shit. No and kidding. And people can take it and then exit the game and leave with it. That's big time. But now we're both YouTubers, so imagine this aspect of it. Some big gaming channel, they buy a $5,000 gun, a $10,000 uh, skin, and the whole the video is, I buy a $10,000 skin and I dropped into a public server, here's what happened. And then just imagine watching the how the virality of that. It's like, that's going to make a shit ton of money. Like, it has to. It, it has to. So, like, and let's say, like, that that pink slip is now an NFT, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, you have that in your wallet, and then you just go and you're like, hey, look, I got this $10,000 gun, and I'm going to go put this on, like, as for, like, a resale. Because I know, like, with some of the other games, it's against their TOS, their terms of service, to actually take those and, like, resell them. But if you can do something like that, and you can put it on a, on a, on a, on a tertiary market or a third market, wow. Well, Shrapnel... That, that's one of the whole things. They have fiat in and out. So you can sell that. You can <laughs> grab that YouTuber's gun. You can sell it on the, on their marketplace. You can exit in fiat. And guess what? You're, you just made $5,000 gaming. And and yet, and this is the thing. Like I, I hear that. I'm like, that makes sense. But yet, if you get a lot of the, the, the Web2 individuals, the ones that are traditional gamers, they look at that and they go cash grab. Yeah, so it's a shame that they would think that because right now with, you know, all the current games, you buy all these skins, you buy all these things in game and that's stuck there forever. You it's a burnt cost. And now for the first time we have, you know, this thing that, you know, maybe on surface seems like a cash grab, but you can get that money back out. And that's that's very rare. I think it's just going to come down to they got to make like shrapnel like you were talking about. That's a game that people want to play. Once they get into it, they go, "Oh, this is free." Okay, I'm going to let this yep. slide. They're going to play it. And then I'm like, okay, what's this Web3 part? And then they're going to get into that part. I think it's a natural progression, but it's going to take time because trust has been broken, and rightfully so. And then they're going to come in. I I think so, but who knows? I hope so. Um, but yeah, deep in AI, uh, gaming, these are three major focuses for me. This cycle hopefully all pays off. Oh, there is one more, one more narrative. Meme coins. <laughs> I think we need to talk about that because- You tweet about the meme coins and stuff and dabble in I- I'm I'm afraid. <laughs> and, and Show me the way, Rob. As well, you sh well, I'm not the guy. There's a there's a guy that uh, he owns the uh, San Juan Smokehouse. His name's Stephen Ellis, and he is the true degen. He's my my degen in charge, and he'll tell me about all these wacky projects that are coming out. And I'm like, why do you think that's going to do well? Well, it's this narrative in this community, and that's pretty much it. I'm like, that's going to do well. Yeah, and it's, sure enough, it does well. So it's one of those things where like, I look at it, it's so super risky. But one thing I, I will say, we we're talking about VC coins a little bit ago with Solana. 
And one of the things that people hate about VCs, and rightfully so, is that they get into these seed, pre-seed, private sales, right? Pennies on the dollar. Then when it gets released, it's so like, let's say like tomato coin. It's for a, a nickel. Right? They get it for a nickel. It gets listed on a centralized exchange, tier one, tier two, doesn't matter. And it's it's immediately at 50 cents, right? And then it blows up to three, four, five dollars. What do you think a VC is going to do? That's what they do, right? They just they just say, well, I'm going to sell because this is what my, my, my whole life purpose is, is to dump on people. But for like these meme coins, it's just like, hey, there it is. All of it is just out there. Do what do what you want with it. There is no like private rounds. There is no seed sales. It's just if, if we have a circulating supply and a total supply, it's the same thing. Here they all are. You can go pick them up on this Dex. Have fun, and that's where I think people are like, all right, I'll get into that. And that's where the gamble comes in, mm-hmm. and that's where the rug pulls come in. But that's where there are some funds that are funds that are made. But it's very very risky. And um, one or two things going to happen. Ninety nine percent of the time, point nine, you're going to lose everything. But that point one percent, you could. You might make some money. Yeah, I haven't thought about it like that. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I ma- most people, I imagine, only lose money in meme coins. But it is a bit of an equalizer, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It does level the playing field, which... But you just got to... Yeah, you have to be savvy enough to be on that playing field. <laughs> Dude, and you, you got to be ballsy. Because if you're out there, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, And that's why like, my very first rule is don't invest more than you can afford to lose. If you... I lived in Vegas for two years. There's nothing wrong with with gambling. But what is wrong is when you go in there and you're degenerate and you're like, you know what? I just sold my kid's college fund. Let's put it all on black. And that's... A, there's But there's varying degrees. And I think that's where like, you know, Gary Gensler is like trying to protect us from that. Look, if you want to protect anybody, go down the casinos. They need a lot of help with with some of those people that are just degenerate gamblers. Here, I think we know what we're getting into for the most part. And I just don't see, you know, see the issue. But with meme coins, it is one of those things. There is one that I, I do like, and I always talk about it. It's, um well, there's two. There's Bonk, which I always thought was going to be great. And it's kind of goofy. But there is one, it's called Tuker, Tuker Curlson. I own it. I own, a, I, own a, I, own a, I own a good amount of it. But what's great is that if you ever watch The Daily Show, like mm-hmm. like back in the day, yep. not when it wasn't funny, when it was funny. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that, but it's their own token. And what they do is they get advertisers on and the advertisers that pay, they buy the token, they burn it. So I'm like, well, there's a little utility huh. in meme coin. Yeah, so I, I I like that part of it. And and of course, Bonk and Bonk Rewards, stuff like that. I got to meet with them actually uh, this, 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 uh, this week. But I mean- all those things, let me make sure everyone realizes that you'll probably lose everything. And that's what meme coins are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, every responsible YouTuber says like, don't invest more than you can lose. And I know as a viewer, I'm sure you get a little bit of like, you know, fatigue of hearing it and it's kind of meaningless words or whatever, but it's really true. Like you should, if you need, if you need the money, you should not be putting it into the crypto market, no matter how potential the potential is the opportunity how promising the idea is how much of a sure thing it is like it's just a recipe for disaster almost every time it is you know what it's and like i i i feel like we have to say that so much because we're under scrutiny but if you go to like a payday loan place you know and you're like i really you know i need this money okay well you know you're looking at 27 percent interest rate and of course you got to pay it back or else it balloons up to something else like there's no like there's oversight they, they, they might send you like a like a little piece of paper you sign it sure or whatever else for you know you're in major debt so like when I take a look at like this part here, if you just follow like the basics like Andy was talking about, you know, don't invest more than you can afford to lose, dollar cost average in, try to get a little bit out, and then don't go crazy. I think there's, it's not so bad, but I think people get ahead of themselves. And that's, I think, the problem. Yeah. And, and FOMO is real, uh, but the reality is, and maybe you can back me up on this, but like the past several cycles I've been a part of, there is no shortage of opportunities. Every single one I've ever missed, there's a hundred to replace it. So like, if you're going to beat yourself up about like trying to just get in and you're overextending just, it's just like, be patient because yeah, so much. It You know what? It's, it's, there's, there's two types of, in my mind, there's always like a couple different types of crypto projects. One are like the blue chips we talked about, 80% MVRVZ scores, you know, and uh, well multiple and all the stuff we talked about. But there's another another strategy that we talk about on the, on, on the show. There's two videos as far as taking profits. One is that 80%. The other one is the half and half method. Because what you just said, there is 
it's like a party bus, right? It's like a party bus in Vegas. If you miss the first party bus in Vegas, don't worry. In 10 minutes, there's one coming night down the street. Same thing with, with, with crypto projects. So like what I always do is I'm getting into some risky stuff like on Dan Degen when I talk about it. As soon as it lists, if it doubles, I immediately sell half. And that's what most people will tell you. Just sell half and you're good. But the step further is this. You, 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 you're not just there just to like break even. You're there to turn a profit, right? So when it halves, I take half. Now I'm playing with house money. The half that's there, then I take that. And if it two, three, four, six X's, I take it, I, I half it from there, depending on how fast it goes. And then if it goes two, three, four X again, I do the same thing. Half, take it off, two, three, four X, half, take it off. And we took a look at Ethereum back in the day. And if we did Ethereum, uh, did that same principle, like you could have, I mean, it was less than a less than a dollar. So if you put in a thousand dollars on 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 Ethereum today, you would have had over uh, over a million dollars if you had done the same the same process three or four times. You'd have been fine, and you would have been no stress. Yeah, no stress. I mean, just take the profits. Don't be the hero and like hold your bags forever. Like, yeah, there is a lot of value there. I think that's a great place to leave people some responsibility here at the end of this. Um, that they probably will not take to heart and just YOLO into the next meme coin. But hey, you know, we got to shoot our shot, right? Hey, man, the, the, the best teacher is pain. So if you want to do it, go right ahead. Yes. And, uh, and through the pain, if you can just not give up, because I've experienced so much pain in my first cycle and, you know, watched so many other people who gave up and just said it's a scam, I wrote it off, whatever. And they went on with their lives. That's fine if that's you. But if you actually want to like make it in the space, you just got to, have the pain, learn the, the ho horrible lesson from the pain, and then move forward um, if you actually want to make it. And be stubborn. Got to be stubborn. Well, Rob, this was fun. Good to have you on. Thanks for coming in and making this happen. Absolutely. We'll have to do this again. Yep. Next year. Uh, I'll leave everything, all of his links and stuff down in the description. But thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.